For a number of hours, the Turkish coup plotters took control of buildings, media outlets, and the bridges in both countries, in both cities rather, in Istanbul and Ankara. But the attempted coup was short-lived. I'd like to bring back Gündar Aybet to discuss the pro-coup military tactics or lack thereof. Gündar, was this um, a poorly planned coup or was it just a matter of fact that they didn't have enough manpower? Yeah, I mean, in terms of planning, I think, you know, it, it was planned well um, in the sense that, you know, that there were jets flying and helicopters and uh, the fact that they moved in very quickly. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to get a tank onto a bridge before closing main roads. Uh, so it was done very quickly because by the time, uh, I mean, I remember that night at first I was at the UK consulate at a party and then I went to NTV, I was on live TV. None of us knew this was happening. It was only after I left the TV studio, I was actually one of the first people to get stuck on the bridge. Uh, and then I realized what was going on. Uh, but so 10 p.m. on a Friday night? I 10 p.m. on a Friday night, yeah. I mean, so in that sense, it was planned well. But I think implementation-wise, they weren't ready for it. And so the question mark is, why would you initiate something that looked, looks reasonably well planned on paper, but you know you're not really ready to do? Uh, so that's one big question mark. Because even when I was on the bridge, I noticed that it wasn't a very large group of soldiers that were on the bridge. And that's so, why I asked him, was it lack of manpower? Because it was only in Istanbul yeah, and in yeah, Ankara. There was a lack of manpower, I think, definitely, because um, the, um, it looks like initially they were able to take uh, strategic points and buildings, but they couldn't hold on to them for very long. Because when you look at the number of soldiers that are taking each point, there's not a, a very high number of them, uh, which is why, you know, uh, when the, the people actually did take to the streets after the president's call, there wasn't really a lot they could do. Uh, and the tanks started to turn around. So uh, what's important is to be able to take something and then hold on to it. They weren't able to hold on to it. So in that respect, I think, you know, it was very thinly spread in terms of manpower. And, and you're right, it was only in Istanbul and Ankara. Uh, but maybe uh, there's also uh, a sense, there could have been among the coup plotters, a sense of smugness that comes from erstwhile military tradition in this country that, you know, if the soldiers declare a coup and they're out there, then the people are just going to follow through because that's exactly what happened with previous coups. But then when you look at 1980, I mean, that was actually initiated by uh, the very higher echelons of the chief of staff, including the chief of staff himself, and there was a lot more manpower. So um, they had full control. Here we're actually seeing uh, a, a fracture in the armed forces where, you know, it's, it's deeply divided as to, uh, with, with regards to this coup in any case, because we've seen uh, senior commanders, including the chief of staff himself, against the coup, uh, but we've also recently seen arrests of some very high-ranking officers, which is also very puzzling, because initially, um, you know, we thought it would be something that was initiated by a group of colonels or maybe you know uh, soldiers that are not ranking that much higher in the armed forces uh, so within the whole hierarchy of the armed forces uh, there seems to be a serious fraction there uh, sort of a serious uh, division and we're not sure uh, what what the situation there is between these two fractions and the relations between them okay Gurner, thank you very much for the time and we're going to have you much more from you a little later on okay